Flying Red Horse. The makers of Mobile Gas and Mobile Oil bring you the Orson Welles Show. Listen, America, listen to how an amazing new chemical discovery is speeding victory. For the first time in history, the synthetic bead catalyst created by the makers of mobile gas is now being used in the refining of aviation gasoline. In Torrance, California, the fourth unit of our vast refining plant is now on stream. It's the first and only refining unit in the world now charged with the catalytic bead. This sensational advance in petroleum chemistry makes possible the production of new and better gasoline for our war planes. Gasoline that's much more powerful than 100 octane fuel. We call this new super fuel flying horsepower. Its tremendous power ingredients enable our planes to take off quicker and carry heavier bomb loads than ever before. Today, the new synthetic bead catalyst that looks much like an iridescent pearl has just one single job, to improve the quality and increase the quantity of aviation fuel for war. But after victory, it will help to produce new and better gasoline for your car. Because flying horsepower is coming in mobile gas at the sign of the flying red horse. Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Orson Welles. Tonight we're broadcasting from the Wrigley Building here in Chicago. We came down here to do a bond show night before last. Martha O'Driscoll was on my plane. You know Martha O'Driscoll. She's got blonde hair and green eyes and, uh, well... Best way to describe the rest of her. But Martha was on my plane when we started out from California. The Treasury Department assigned two Secret Service men to keep an eye on her. By the time we got to Albuquerque, they had four Secret Service men keeping an eye on the two Secret Service men. <laughs> well, I was sitting next to Martha. It was embarrassing the way the stewardess kept coming over to tell me to stop smoking. It wasn't her fault, though. How was she to know I didn't have a cigarette? <laughs> Thank you, Mother. <laughs> Jack Benny... Jack Benny uh, was sitting in front of me on the plane. Every time we came in for a landing, he handed me his wallet and said, Orson, if anything happens, you owe this to Mary. <laughs> I also do Ronald Coleman. <laughs> Orson, if anything happens, you owe this to Mary. <laughs> I uh, got off the plane in Chicago, and there were thousands of people, really thousands of people, waving, shouting, whistling. It's quite an impressive sight. But no matter what they did, they couldn't get a taxi. Chicago, as you know, is a convention city now. The Republicans are having their little get-together. <laughs> of course, the hotels, the hotels are all crowded. Quite a few of the delegates are traveling with their relatives, though, this year. One or two had their wives with them. Some of them brought their mothers. <laughs> Most of the delegates came with old granddad. <laughs> Not me, though. I brought, I brought a lovely young lady, I mentioned her before, who couldn't fail to brighten up any convention, Martha O'Driscoll. Thank you. Hello, Orson. Hello, Martha. I haven't seen you since we arrived. Where have you been? Well, I, I know the convention doesn't start until Monday, but I just couldn't resist hanging around convention hall. Well, I can understand that, Martha. After all, you must have been a very little girl the last time you saw a Republican. The, uh... <laughs> convention spirit's really in the air, though, isn't it, Martha? What do you mean? Well, you must have noticed all the way from California we had sunny weather, but the minute we got over Chicago, everything began to get a little dewy. <laughs> I suppose you've noticed, uh, I suppose you've noticed that quite a few women delegates come in for the convention this year. What do you think of them, Martha? Women delegates are fine, Orson, but when it comes to a really important issue, it takes a man delegate. Why, when he gets up there, he really sways the people. Why, he takes off his coat and his hat and he rolls up his sleeve. I don't know, Gypsy Rose Lee could do the same thing, it'd be more enjoyable. <laughs> then you're in favor of women delegates? No, I'm in favor of Gypsy Rose Lee. <laughs> but frankly, Martha, women delegates frighten me a little bit. They really do, they scare me. Why? Uh, well... I don't know, I get a picture of a group of women delegates in one of those famous smoke-filled rooms, you know, in a committee room. They're all seated about the large conference table in the hotel. They're all quietly discussing their candidate. <laughs> girls! Girls! Really, now, we must get something done. We're here to pick a candidate for president. We've been here for 15 days, and we've had 95 ballots, and it's still Frank Sinatra. Say, that reminds me, girls. There's a wonderful sale at Marshall Fields today. Gee, what have they got? Oh, they have a new Marshall Fields. Girls, we're picking a president, remember? Now, look. 
All we need is one more vote to put our candidate's got some Google, Googledorfer across. Yeah, and we'll never get it. You know those women. Wait a minute. There is a man delegate at this convention, isn't there? A man? Yeah. yeah. Say, Clarence Crowley from Wisconsin. But he's been voting for Sinatra. Uh, Margie, Margie, bring Miss Clarence right in, and the rest of you girls just leave me alone. Oh, oh God, God damn right. Yeah. Uh, come in. Hi, I'm Clarence. Oh, yes. Come in, come in. Uh, um, won't you sit down? No, I've got to go out and get, uh, cast my ballot. Oh, please sit down. No, I, 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 I... Oh, oh, that's better. What's better? Uh... Mm, you comfortable? Yes, thank you. Not too heavy for you, am I? <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um... Have a cigar. No, thanks. Don't smoke cigars. You can smoke one, though, if you want to. I thanks. love the smell of good cigar smoke. <laughs> thanks, I will. I oh, really uh, do. I... Oh, uh, Clarence. Clarence. Well, Savannah cigar. Yes. Uh... Uh, who are you voting for? A good cigar. Well, my wife told me to vote for Frank Sinatra. Oh, come, come, Clarence. Haven't you a mind of your own? Don't you wear the pants in your family? Yes, but only because my wife is too chubby for slack. <laughs> only kidding, Rita. You know what I mean. My wife would murder me if I didn't vote for Sinatra. Wife would murder me. She, I, she dreams about him all the time. All night long, she keeps saying, Frankie, I love you. Frankie, I'm crazy about you. Oh, Frankie. Doesn't that make you mad? No, I'm too busy dreaming about Hedy Lamar. <laughs> it's all in the script, you know what I mean? It's a situation. <laughs> well, now look, Clarence. I get back oh, in character. Oh, Clarence. Clarence. Yeah. Um, we're all getting behind Guts and Googledorfer. You better hop on... I beg your on... pardon? I said we're all getting behind Guts and Googledorfer. You better hop on this bandwagon. I beg your pardon? Don't That's you, mean, isn't it? Don't right you want to vote for Guts and Googledorfer? He's the people's choice. I'm glad I don't have to say that. <laughs> Come on, vote for my candidate. Does it say hop on the bandwagon here? Did you yes, say that? Yes, it says hop on the bandwagon, and I said it. All right, I will. No, I'm afraid not. Uh, all right, I'll ask somebody if they're going to vote for Guts and Googledorfer. I'll say, oh, what... Clarence. Yes. Will you please vote for Gutsum Googledorfer? You she better hold on this bandwagon. <laughs> You'll prove it to me? Mm hmm. Or just open that door, you say, and ask anyone around, and I say, all right, I will. Excuse me, buddy, who are you voting for? I am voting for Gutsum Googledorfer. Gutsum Googledorfer is an upstanding, honest, forthright, intelligent American citizen. And I'm proud to say that I am voting for Gutsum Googledorfer. Thank you. And what's your name? Gutsum Googledorfer. <laughs> You see? See? Now what do you say? No, I better stick with Sinatra. Do you really want Sinatra to get in? No, it's my wife that wants him, but don't worry, Sinatra hasn't got a chance. What makes you think... What makes you be so sure? Well, I happen to know. When last seen, Sinatra was dropping a letter in an office building mail chute, and the downdraft sucked him in. <laughs> a one-cent stamp would take him anywhere. <laughs> now, uh, oh, Clarence, Clarence... Yes? Um... Googledorfer is the people's choice. Uh, you do want to vote for him, don't you? Don't you? Please, you're mussing my hair. Mm. <laughs> It'd make me feel so happy if you'd vote for Googledorfer. No, I don't want you, it. Oh, you do want to make me happy, don't you, Clarence? Hmm? Ladies, you know what you're doing? If you don't, you better ask somebody. <laughs> now, who are you going to vote for? Sinatra, the people's choice. I'm going to vote for Sinatra. Mm, Clarence. <laughs> I'm going to vote for the Sinatra, the voice of the people. I'm going to vote for Sinatra. Uh, Clarence. Kiss me, Clarence. Uh, I'm going to... Hmm? Say, that Googledorfer had some good points, too, hasn't it? Then you're going to see to it that Googledorfer gets the nomination tonight? Hmm? Hmm? Yes, but I'm going to... I'm going to hate myself for this in the morning. <laughs>
pardon me. I beg your pardon. What a pretty girl. Which one of you is the announcer on this program? Well, I, am. I, am. I, am. I am. Oh, no. You can't all be talking about mobile oil. I'm the announcer, and believe me, everybody's talking about mobile oil. And now's the time to change to summer mobile oil, the right grade for warm weather driving. Oh. Do you realize every car needs special care these days? No one ought to drive through summer with the crankcase half full of worn, tired-out winter oil. Mm, that can lead to breakdowns, big repair bills. Yeah, that's right. So you give your car the world's best seller, mobile oil. You got a car? Uh-huh. Then mobile oil for you, for summer and forever. Fresh, clean mobile oil. It's built to ward off wear and friction. Huh? Oh, sure, you bet. It's built to keep the motor clean and running smoothly through the hot and dusty driving days ahead. I tell you what, you change right now to summer mobile oil. Me? You and everybody. Drive in right away, folks, at the sign of the flying red horse. Say, who are you? How come you know all this and... What's that you're reading? Here, it's your commercial. I found it on the floor outside the studio. Well, I'll be... Gee, I think you're wonderful. Why, you don't even need a script. Well, I'll be... Well, I'll be getting summer mobile oil. I'm sold. <laughs> This is uh, Orson Welles again. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're broadcasting from the great, big, beautiful city of Chicago, which tonight furnishes the background for our Mercury fable. The scene, a modest little apartment on the north side of Chicago. Victor Brill, a modest little businessman, is talking to his modest little wife, Martha. Uh, put down that shade, dear. I don't want anybody to know we're home. Not that they'd stop in anyway. Oh, don't be so bitter, dear. You've been brooding for weeks now. Why don't you go out and bowl with the boys for a while? Well, I couldn't, Martha. I can't face them. No sense in pretending, Martha. They don't show it, but they know. Well, what if they do know? You've still got to look them straight in the eye. Now more than ever, our child needs it. Oh, I understand that. I'm trying to be modern about it, but that doesn't lessen the shame. Think of it. Our Harvey is the only child in Chicago who has never been on the quiz kid. <laughs> That's all right, dear. I know how you feel. It we have a small group here in Chicago, everybody, but all good friends, and we're so glad you came. I thought I had to go right there. <laughs> Darling, I, I know I know how you feel. It's tough on both of us. Well, it's not so bad for you, dear. You can hide in the house all day. I've got to go out among people. Their stares, their whispers. And it's the things they don't say that hurt most. Why, do you know I haven't been invited to the elk smoker for five weeks? Any day now, we may hear a rap on the door and a voice say, Brill, turn in your elk stew. <laughs> Don't you care, dear. It looked better on the elk than it does on you. I've done everything I can. I can say that again. I try in every way to make up for Harvey's shortcoming. Whenever I'm with the boys, I'm the first one to buy a round of Alka-Seltzers. <laughs> then the conversation starts. Did you hear what my little Joe said on the Quiz Kids Sunday night? Did you hear what my little Frank said? My Ted, my Fred, my Henry? Then it's my turn. What do I say? Have another Alka-Seltzer, boys. <laughs> Please, darling, you mustn't let this get you down. After all, Harvey's a healthy little boy. Healthy, yes. The things he says, sometimes he frightens me. I don't understand you, dear. I've always believed Harvey's conversation to be perfectly normal. Normal? Darling, the boy is nine years old, and he only speaks English. <laughs> Discouraging. <laughs> Walk up to a youngster on any street in Chicago and say, nice weather we're having. And he immediately replies, nice weather indubitably. The barometric <laughs> pressure indicates a reading of 30.14 inches. <laughs> With a mean precipitation of 69.428, tomorrow cumulus cloud strata, not untinged with cirrus. That's very clever, dear. Very clever. Sure, but you walk up to Harvey and say, nice weather we're having, he says it stinks. <laughs> Discouraging. But darling, darling, maybe you're expecting too much of Harvey. What do you want him to do? Grow up to be another Orson Welles? If he does that, I'll drown him. Oh, Victor, Victor, please. Hello, Mom. Hello, Pop. Nice weather we're having, isn't it? It stinks. <laughs> Look, Harvey, I want to have a little talk with you. That's right, boys. You have a nice little talk, and I'll go in and prepare supper. Make a lot, Mom. I'm hungry. Make a lot, Mom. I'm hungry. <laughs> Is that all you ever think of your stomach? Pop, that's a plain case of the pot calling the kettle black. You eat like there's no tomorrow. Harvey. <laughs> Harvey. Let's face it, I'm disappointed in you. Why, Dad? Well, I'll show you why. What time is it, Harvey? 6.30. I knew you'd say that. If I'd asked Joe or Kupperman, he'd say 6.30 in Chicago, 7.30 in New York, 12.30 in London, 3.30 in Madrid, and 6.30 in Cairo. Yeah, That's but Joe by the Kupperman. time he gets through with that whole routine, it's ten minutes later in Chicago. What good is information like that, Pop? It's important. Suppose you flew to Lisbon. How'd you know the time there? I asked a Lisbonian. You'd ask a Lisbonian. <laughs> What would you do, Pop? 
Well, with you, you thought they'd slide back to Chicago and ask Joel Kupperman. <laughs> Harvey, I don't understand you. How do you ever expect to get promoted in That's school? That's easy. An occasional apple for the teacher, a box of cigars for the principal. You know, a little greasing in the right place. <laughs> Harvey, Harvey, don't you ever want to get on the Quiz well, Kids program? Uh, I've got work to do. Excuse me. Oh, don't mind me. Go right ahead. Phone, Harvey. I'll be going inside. Hello, Joel. This is Harvey. Five across the board and Knickerbocker in the six. <laughs> Victor! Victor, what are you doing in those knee pants? Martha, I can't stand the shame any longer. This is a little like Hanley Stafford, I think I'm going to. <laughs> Martha, I can't stand the shame any longer. I'm going to do something desperate. Oh, you mean you're going to... No, uh, yes. He picks up his cues better, Hanley does. You mean you're going to... <laughs> yes, hand me my lollipop and I'll be off. Harvey, I want to hear this program. All right, all right, children. And tonight we have a new member of the Quiz Kids who has never been with us before. Harvey? Harvey? My name is Harvey Brill. I'm nine years old and I'm a student at the Betty Rowland High School. That's Pop. He's using my name. Quiet, Harvey. Harvey is rather big for his age, folks, but we have an affidavit and a birth certificate proving he's only nine years old. Yes, I'm big for my age. I eat spinach and I eat spinach. And Harvey, I eat quite a Harvey, lot of since this is your the first night. appearance with us, perhaps you'd like to tell us some of the I'm things you're interested in. I'm not fond of spinach, but I, um... <laughs> well, well I like books and flowers, and I'm crazy about moving pictures. Jane Eyre is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and he's only nine yeah. years old. Jane Eyre is All my right, favorite. All right, here's our first question. Mrs. Pampson of 218 North Pine Street wants to know three or four times if a horse yesterday. can run a mile in two minutes and 16 seconds with a handicap of 20 pounds, how fast can he run seven furlongs with a handicap of 24 pounds if the wind is eight miles an hour against him on the back stretch Jones and Montana four miles an hour with him on the home stretch, provided the home stretch is half the length of the back stretch, which uh, runs southeast? Jane Harvey? Well, let me see. How far can Mrs. Pampson... No, 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 no. Uh, how fast can a horse... Uh, uh, how can a fast, uh, oh, yeah. How fast can a horse carry Mrs. Frampton, who weighs 24 pounds? No, 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 no. Ah, no, no, that's it. Four minutes, 13, and three, ten seconds. No coaching from the audience, please. <laughs> Harvey, I'm afraid I'll have to give you the answer. It's two minutes, 13, and three, ten seconds. Right. All right, here's the next question. Let's see what you can do with this, Man, Harvey. Woman, you know, if yeah. a chicken and a half lays an egg and a half in a day and a half, how long would it take a monkey with a wooden leg to kick all the seeds out of a dill pickle? <laughs> you repeat that, please? <laughs> if that... Uh, well, this is a coincidence. So this, am I. This question was submitted by Harvey Brill. Hey, Mom, they're using my question. Quiet, Harvey. Uh, surely you must know the answer to it, Harvey. I, I, I submitted it? Well, you're Harvey Brill, aren't you? Uh, well, I, uh, I submitted it. Oh, stupid of me to let it slip my mind. Of course I did. All right, I'm Harvey. Sort of a grown-up Ed Wynn now. I... What's the answer, Harvey? Well, let's see. An egg and a half goes into a thicken and a half... No, it don't. It comes out. <laughs> oh, I got it. Don't tell me. An egg and a half divided by a wooden leg. If you move the decimal point over behind the thicken, then the... The answer was it would take two hours and ten minutes for the thicken to kick all the pickles out of the monkey. <laughs> You must eat something. Sorry, dear. I'm just not hungry. How far can a horse carry? Harvey, I said we weren't going to discuss it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Harvey. What do you want me to say? Sorry, Smarry. You made me look like a jerk. <laughs> it wasn't all my fault, Harvey. Fine question you sent in that stuck me with you and you're kicking the pickles out of monkeys. Hello? Oh, I'll wait till I answer the phone for that. Hello? E.F. Hutton and Company? E.F. Hutton and Company, brokerage, Harvey. You want to speak to Mr. Brill? That's for me, Pop. Hello? Speaking. I think you better sell it. What else you got? That sounds good. Buy 5,000 of that and hold it for a long pull. Harvey, what was that all about? Just picking up a couple of hot bucks. <laughs> Investments. And where did you get the money to invest? I'll tell you, Pop. You know that bridge on Michigan Boulevard over the Chicago River? Well, I told the cop I was building him a little shack to keep him out of the sun. Yes? Well, when he ain't looking... I hang up a sign, toll bridge 15 cent, 50 cents, and I'm mopping up. Martha, Martha, I've been mistaken about Harvey. Son, you and I are going to do a little trip uh, Monday. Sorry, Pop, I can't make it Monday. Well, why not? I've got to make the nominating speech 
for Dewey at the Republican Convention. <laughs> Despite a no small measure of enthusiasm, the Mercury Theater brings you now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the great singers of our day, a song stylist of high and authentic style, a fine artist, and international favorite, Miss Ethel Waters. Thank you, Mr. Wells and friends. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky. you please, ladies and gentlemen, from Shakespeare. With your kind indulgence, a speech from one of the classic melodramas of our literature, a soliloquy by Shakespeare's greatest villain, the misshapen evil genius Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and later King of England. Here's the plot. Three claimants stood between the humpback monster and his ambition for the crown. Yet in those desperate days of civil war, blood and destruction were so in use that it was feasible for Richard to plot a way by trickery and murder over their corpses to the English throne. I, Edward, will use women honorably. Would he were wasted, marrow, Bones and all, that from his loins no hopeful branch may spring to cross me from the golden time I look for. And yet, between my soul's desire and me, is Clarence, Henry, and his young son Edward, and all the unlooked for issue of their bodies to take their rooms ere I can place myself. A cold premeditation for my purpose. Well, say there is no kingdom then for Richard. 
What other pleasure can the world afford? I'll make my heaven in a lady's lap and deck my body in gay ornaments and witch sweet ladies with my words and looks. <laughs> Miserable thought. And more unlikely than to accomplish 20 golden crowns. Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb. For I should not deal in her soft laws. She did corrupt frail nature with some bribe to shrink mine arm up like a withered shrub, to make an envious mountain on my back where sits deformity to mock my body, to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportion me in every part, like to a chaos or an unlit bare whelp that carries no impression like the dam. And am I then a man to be beloved? <laughs> Monstrous fault to harbor such a thought. Then, since this earth affords no joy to me, but to command, to check, and to obey such as are of a better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live to account this world but hell until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a glorious crown. And yet I know not how to get the crown, for many lives stand between me and home. And I, like one lost in a thorny wood, torment myself to catch the English crown. And from that torment, I will free myself, or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why, I can smile and murder whilst I smile, and cry content to that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions, and set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this, and cannot get a crown? But were it further off, Pictures is currently featured in Universal's Ghost Catchers. Ed Roberts speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.